Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Hi, everybody. This is Peter Bermel. I'm here with Nano Hub U's uh, Nano Photonic Modeling class, and today we're going to go through lecture 1.3 on 2D band structures, and specifically extending on our previous work looking at the behavior of 1D band structures. So we kind of understand the basic concept of how a band structure works in the sense that we understand, first of all, uh, the mathematical framework, which is solving eigenvalue equations. And we also understand uh, the fact that in many cases, most potentials will give rise to band gaps in our band structures. And the result of these uh, band gaps that very frequently occur, at least we saw in 1D, is that uh, you often have like a range of energies that are forbidden from ex existing in the system. But now we need to see what happens like when you go to higher dimensionalities. Is that still going to hold true or not? Uh, but there's a need for like kind of a mathematical framework in order to do these calculations correctly. And so that's what we're going to talk about with reciprocal lattice vectors. If we're working in uh, Fourier space in these higher dimensions, then we have to define this reciprocal lattice vector, which we call G, as in great, uh, because they're great to work with. And uh, we have uh, this definition for the G vectors that says that the complex exponential e to the i g dot r, where r is the periodic lattice uh, repetition, uh, will be equal to 1. And so then that basically tells us that uh, g dot r will be a multiple of 2 pi, because we know each of the 2 pi i is 1, each of the 4 pi i is 1, et cetera. And so then that means that if we know the r, values, then we also know what the g values are directly. And so as it says at the bottom here, uh, if we have a 1D lattice of period A, then uh, g would be equal to 2 pi m divided by A from that relationship that I gave you. And then more generally, we can construct like a whole set of periodic functions f of r, which consists of uh, these e to the i g dot lower r times this f of g, which is kind of like our 2D or 3D version of those CGs that we had earlier. And now we can actually calculate these f of g explicitly from a real potential using uh, the orthogonality relations from Fourier analysis, which tell us that if we integrate over the volume of a system, uh, the actual potential like f of r times the e to the minus i g dot r over like a unit cell of the system, then we'll get this f of g. So in a 2D lattice, of course, um, if we think of it as a square lattice, then we're going to have uh, two uh, directions in which the lattice vectors can occur, the x and y directions in Cartesian coordinates. And in both cases, we can see that the the fundamental lattice vector in each direction is like 2 pi divided by a times that appropriate uh, lattice direction, which we call x hat, like the unit x vector, and then y hat for the unit y vector. And then all uh, reciprocal lattice vectors g in general will be basically integer multiples of g1 plus g2. And so we get that the overall g is g m mg1 plus pg2. Now, if we had a triangular lattice, then of course these uh, two directions are not orthogonal to each other in Cartesian basis, but instead they're uh, separated by a 60 degree angle. And so then we might represent one direction as the x direction, but then the other one is actually a superposition of the x and y direction. But in this case uh, as well, we would also end up writing that the overall g vector is just a linear sum of integer multiples of g1 and g2. And of course, this just two examples. You could also have a rectangular uh, lattice, a rhombic lattice, or even an oblique lattice in 2D. Now, if we went to 3D, then there are even more 
uh, types of lattices that are possible, like basically like periodic repetitions. And actually, in, in all, there are 14 types of these lattices, which are known as Brave lattices in 3D. And so the most obvious uh, one would just be the extension of the square lattice into 3D, which is the simple cubic. And then, there, of course, there are other ones that are very similar, like the simple tetragonal and the simple orthorhombic that are fairly easy to understand from the basis of the simple cubic kind of distorting it. But then there are also some other ones that are more complicated uh, but occur very frequently in real uh, crystals. So for example, the face center cubic and the body center cubic, which are at the upper right-hand corner of the slide. And then there are also uh, hexagonal uh, uh, lattices, which basically look like a hexagon and then have like this cylindrical type connection to the lower hexagons. And then there are also like body-centered and face-centered like distortions of the original cubic structure, as well as uh, what are called like monoclinic and triclinic type lattices, which are common in like uh, calcium fluoride and so on. So if we're in 3D, then as you can probably guess from those previous diagrams, we can't always just guess what the reciprocal lattice vectors will be. So we actually have a set of relationships that we can use to construct uh, all of the lattice vectors from the lattice directions. And so basically what we end up doing is we write down the three key lattice directions in real space, A1, A2, A3, which we refer to as a set of A sub i. And then we define the lattice volume is the triple product of those three vectors, a1 dotted into a2 cross a3. And then that allows us to very quickly derive all of the three uh, reciprocal directions, which we call b1, b2, b3. And then that in turn can give rise to the overall set of uh, reciprocal lattice vectors, which is the linear sum of integer multiples of those three quantities. So we got G equals MB1 plus PB2 plus QB3. And you can see here that the B1s end up being uh, cross products of the other two uh, lattice vectors. So if we want B1, then we cross A2 and A3. We want B2, we cross A3, A1. So it's actually very easy to remember these relationships. And we don't actually even have to worry about the signs too much because in the end, we end up reusing uh, the, the signs, uh, like when we flip the sign of the integers. So in any case, uh, once we have those uh, B1, B2, B3, and Gs constructed, whether it's in 2D or 3D, then we want to construct the Brillouin zone. Okay, and so what is the Brillouin zone? So that basically is this special region uh, in which we can calculate all our band structures. And the reason why it's important is because of the symmetry of these types of problems, everything inside the Brillouin zone will tell us everything we need to know about the system and all the bands and the band structures. So we don't actually have to even look outside of the Brillouin zone to understand the system. So in some sense, this is a generalization of those band structures we saw earlier in 1D, but extended here in this picture into 2D. And so in particular, what we see here is that there are three uh, kind of like key points uh, in this like Brillouin zone that we construct in a triangular lattice. So we start off with a triangular lattice here which you can see like a bunch of spheres connected in this triangle. And then we have these two uh, lattice vectors, and then we construct reciprocal lattice vectors that are basically orthogonal to those. And so then this uh, leads to like a Y vector. And then we have another one that's in this direction. And then we, when we start constructing perpendicular bisectors between these G values, then we end up with uh, crossing here and then we cross here, cross here, et cetera. And so then that gives rise to like this hexagonal Brillouin zone for the triangular lattice. And then we can also actually introduce further symmetries to make what's called an irreducible Brillouin zone, 
And then it's defined by these three points, gamma, m, and k. And then what's interesting about the irreducible Brillouin zone is that given the symmetries of most systems, then this is sufficient to tell us everything we need to know about the system. So we don't necessarily even have to look outside of this little uh, blue region when we calculate our band structures. So that's very advantageous from a computational perspective and also just uh, the perspective of understanding the system successfully. Uh, and we can see that there are certain like high symmetry points that come up all the time in calculating 2D and 3D band structures. And so here I've just presented a few of them. And of course, you can check uh, some references to see more details. But the most common uh, k point is called the gamma point, which represents k equals 0, right inside the middle of the Berlin zone. And then uh, oftentimes you see like what's called the, the x, which is basically extending all the way in the x direction. And so this even crops up in the 1D band structures as well and also in face center cubic structures. And you also have like these uh, so-called L points, W, K, U, and M. And so you can see that these are all superpositions of not just X, but also uh, sometimes Y and Z components. And so you can see that depending on exactly like what sort of symmetry you have in the problem, if you have like face center cubic, then you oftentimes have an L and W point. And then if you have like a hexagonal band structure, then you have these k and u points and so on, right? So basically every uh, set of like uh, lattice vectors and reciprocal lattice vectors give rise to their own set of high symmetry points that are important in the irreducible Brillouin zone. So with that in mind, now we're gonna try to remember the, uh, the expressions that we wrote down earlier for the electronic band structures, which tell us basically what the wave function looks like in the presence of kinetic and potential energy. And uh, we end up with this set of nice recursion relationships, uh, which is that second line that we saw down here. And then this, of course, is what fundamentally gives rise to the band gaps within our band structure. Now, in complete analogy to what I just showed you for Schrodinger's equation, we can do pretty much the same thing for photonic band structures. And so remember that in the first class, we talked about uh, what is the uh, photonic crystal or photonic band structure in a periodic system. And so we wrote down something in this form, which was combining uh, several of Maxwell's equations. Now, if we uh, substitute uh, for all the nabla's uh, k plus g uh, with a minus i in front. And then we basically substitute this epsilon inverse with like a matrix here. Then that gives rise to, instead of uh, what looks like an operator, it gives rise to this matrix, essentially. And then this matrix is going to connect off diagonal terms through this epsilon inverse g, g prime. And then uh, this is going to be equal to the total energy squared of the system, omega over c squared. And so what that tells us now is that we're going to have like basically a column vector of uh, different values of h. And uh, these values of h that correspond to different uh, wave vectors are going to be kind of like the, the basis of our eigen solutions. And then uh, the epsilon is going to tell us like exactly what they look like. So that tells us in turn that when we have inhomogeneous or complex media where epsilon inverse GG prime has some off diagonal elements, then that gives rise to more complicated solutions. And these can be solved in MIT photonic bands, which is also known as MPB. And so if you go to this website, jdjmitedu slash MPB, then you can look up how to use that. Also, there's a implementation that's available on NanoHub of this code. Uh, so you can use that directly. Now, if we use something like MPB, then that allows us to directly solve the 2D band structure problem. Before, remember, we only solved the 1D problem. So now looking at the 2D problem, first of all, uh, let's consider what problem are we solving exactly. 
we're doing a square lattice of rods in air. Okay, so you can see right here that there's like this whole array of green rods that are arrayed periodically in the x and y directions. And we can see that uh, the TM modes are one set of solutions uh, in blue, and then the T modes are another set of solution in red. And so then, first of all, you're asking, like, what is the difference between uh, TE and TM modes? So basically, TE modes have like an even symmetry with respect to the mirror plane in the Z direction, and then TM have odd symmetry, right? So these are completely distinct set of modes in 2D. And so we'll have both in general, and it depends on like what polarization is being introduced into the system from above. So with that said, um, then we also have to look at what is the, the Berlin zone and irreducible Berlin zone. First of all, we know that uh, the, the wave vector, or sorry, I mean the lattice vectors are given by x hat and y hat times a, uh, and so then that tells us that the g vectors are also going to look like uh, 2 pi over a times x hat and y hat. So then that tells us that we have a square uh, Berlin zone, but then also we can reduce that because the symmetry of the problem to irreducible Berlin zone, that's only about uh, one eighth of the original size. And then we only have to look at three high symmetry points and the points in between. And so, so the first high symmetry point, of course, is gamma, and so that occurs pretty much in every band structure. Then we have this x value, and then we have m, and then connect back to gamma. And so then that's what we're doing in this band structure. We're stepping from gamma towards x, towards m, and then back to gamma. And so then this gives rise to like kind of this whole flow. But what's interesting is that if you look at the band structure for red, then there's not necessarily any clear gap in terms of the modes, right? They're all kind of like spanning this whole frequency spectrum. But if you look at the blue curve, then you see there's actually a very large gap from about 0.32 up to almost uh, 0.45 or so. And so then this is basically a photonic band gap, but only in the TM modes, not in the TE modes. So that's kind of interesting that you only see it in one. And so what this is showing basically is the difference between the bands like for the TM modes. Because we saw before in the last slide that the TM modes had a band gap. So presumably there's like a big difference between the top of band one versus the bottom of band two. And so what you can see here is that while it depends on like what uh, point you're at, you would expect that the band gap type behavior is gonna occur mainly at say like the x or the m values. And so what you can see in particular is that uh, at the m values, you're gonna have strong localization of modes inside like this high dielectric region in band one, because like that's lower energy. And then you're gonna have delocalization outside of the high dielectric region in band two. And so this is exactly analogous to what we saw earlier in the 1D band structures in this direction. And then also like in the, at the M point, which is like at uh, X, X hat plus Y hat times a constant, then we have strong localization again of the energy in these modes. And then we have delocalization here, but of course it's tilted at a certain angle because the, uh, the overall wave vector is different, right? So it's more diagonal. So in conclusion, uh, I think that we had a pretty good sense of exactly how the band structures are being calculated. And of course, for uh, many more details, I would encourage you to look at MIT photonic bands so you can try it out yourself. But now we have the ability to calculate band structures in 1D, 2D, and 3D. And then next time we're gonna look at what are kind of the properties of 2D photonic crystals in more detail and what does that tell us about potential applications, perhaps? And so obviously a very good reference for this would be the Gerinopoulos book again, uh, in this case, chapter five. So thank you very much.